Hello everyone, myself is Asa Dapat and today's topic is Asthma Management. I have a bachelor's degree in dentistry and a master's in public health and I have been associated with my Aussie tutor since the past one and a half years with academic writing. Uh, so today's topic is asthma uh, and its management. It's a very common topic that comes up for nursing case studies and clinical case studies. So let's begin with understanding what asthma is, what is the condition, how it develops how it progresses and how we can manage it. So first of all, asthma is defined as a chronic disease of the airways that might cause wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, nighttime or early morning coughing. And episodes are usually associated with widespread but variable airflow obstruction within the lung that is often reversible either spontaneously or with treatment. The pathology basically involves inflammation of the air. So as you can see in the diagram, healthy lungs or healthy alveoli will show no genetic susceptibility to allergens and the microbiome in the lungs will be stable without any wheezing, blockage or epithelial cell inflammation. Whereas an asthmatic individual, the uh, microbiome of lungs and of all the, of the alveoli is altered where the person is genetically susceptible to allergens, therefore leading to the development of asthma. Where the epithelial cells become inflam inflammated and inflamed and release mucus and a mucus plug is formed with inflammation and the smooth muscle cell uh, the smooth muscle cells and the muscle mucus cells are uh, relaxed and are releasing inflammatory mediators therefore causing inflammation and swelling and the mucus plug which causes airflow obstruction and difficulty in breathing they are inflamed and uh, present with causing wheezing breathlessness and tightness. The pathophysiology and the pathogenesis of asthma. Airflow limitation in asthma is recurrent and caused by a variety of changes in the airway. These include bronchoconstriction. In asthma, the dominant physiological event that leads to clinical symptoms is airway narrowing and a subsequent interference with the airflow. This airway narrowing is uh, happens in acute exacerbation of asthma as well, where the bronchial smooth muscle con contract contraction causes bronchoconstriction, which occurs quickly to narrow the airways in response to exposure to a variety of stimuli, including allergens or irritants. Allergen-induced acute bronchoconstriction results from an IgE-independent release of mediators from mast cells that includes histamine, tryptophan, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins that directly contract the airway smooth muscle. Airway edema, as the disease becomes more persistent and inflammation more progressive, other factors further limit airflow, as we showed you in the previous diagram, which includes edema, inflammation, mucus hypersecretion, forming mucus plugs, incipitated mucus plugs, as well as structural changes, including hyperatrophy and hyperplasia of the airway smooth muscle. Airway remodeling, in some persons who have asthma, airflow limitation may only be partially reversible. Permanent structural changes can occur in the airway associated with a progressive loss of lung function that is not prevented or by or fully reversible by current therapy. Airway remodeling involves an activation of many of the structural cells, consequent permanent changes in the airway that increases the airflow obstruction and airway responsiveness and also renders the patient less responsive to any kind of therapy. Airway hyper-responsiveness is an exaggerated bronchial response to a wide variety of stimuli and it is a major but not necessarily unique feature of asthma. The degree to which airway hyper-responsiveness can be defined by contractile responses to challenges with metacholine correlates with the clinical severity of asthma. The mechanisms influencing airway hyper-responsiveness are multiple and include inflammation, dysfunctional neuroregulation and structural changes. Inflammation appears to be a major factor in determining the degree of airway hyper-responsiveness. Risk factors for developing asthma are genetic characteristics that is atopy, that is the body is predisposed to develop an antibody called immunoglobulin EIgE in response to any exposure to any kind of environmental allergens. It can be measured in the blood and it includes allergic rhinitis, asthma, hay fever, eczema, it can cause all of these things. Environmental factors are exposure to allergens and smoke including biological and chemical agents. Chemical agents could be tobacco smoke, NO2, formaldehyde, extensive fragrances, etc. Biological agents could be any kind of house dust, mites, cockroaches, pets, trees, grass and wild pollen. Clinical presentation of asthma now as you have seen the pathophysiology and the trigger factors for asthma. What is the clinical presentation that comes to, across to us in terms of a patient having asthma? It is marked by recurrent episodes of wheezing, coughing, dyspnea, and chest tightness. Patients may have several or only one of these findings. Many report minimal or no wheezing. Hence, it is important to obtain a good history of symptoms in assessing a patient for asthma. Symptoms may occur as a result of exposure to an environmental trigger. But such triggers may or may not cause symptoms in individuals individual patients with asthma. Typically, each patient has a unique list of triggers recognized as causing increased symptoms or flares. 
Common triggers include infections, exercise, weather changes, pollen, animal dander, dust mites, and mold. Some patients with asthma experience symptoms with the use of aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, that is NSAIDs, or with the consumption of beer or red wine. Some women have worsening symptoms with menses. Patients may be unaware of these associations, so direct questioning regarding unique triggers is required for an accurate and appropriate diagnosis. Most patients with asthma experience onset of symptoms in childhood or adolescence. Atopia is a major predisposing factor for developing asthma as a child. 60% of children younger than 6 years of age also wheeze, who wheeze have associated atopia. Some adolescents may experience remission of childhood asthma, but this appears to be the exception rather than the rule. Factors that predict resistance of asthma from childhood into, ad- into adulthood include female sex, family history of asthma, atopy, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, obesity, and rhinitis or sinusitis. Some individuals who have no history of asthma as a child or a teenager develop the disorder as adults, example after 40, including some with apparently new onset asthma after age 60. So now the classification of asthma based on its severity and the component of severity are described as following in this table. So first of all, for all youth greater than less than 12 years of age and all adults, this is the classification for them. So first of all, your asthma will be known as an intermittent asthma if the symptoms are less than two days per week, if nighttime awakening due to inability to breathe properly or chest tightness and wheezing is less than two times a month, and if the short-acting beta agonist that is used for symptom control is effective and it is working and you have to take it only less than two days per week. And interference with normal activity is none. Lung function is normal with FEV1 between exacerbations and FEV1 greater than 80% as predicted. And FEV1 ratio to FBC is normal. Uh, when will they be known as for, as a risk? Uh, that is exacerbation that required oral systemic corticosteroids if this condition continues for 0 to 1 year. Approximately up to one year, then it will arise, then it will be considered as a risk factor. Next category, uh, asthma severity is not intermittent, but it is persistent. If the asthma is persistent, then also it is classified into three categories, mild, moderate and severe. Mild asthma will be when symptoms will be less than two days per week, but not daily. Greater than two days, but not daily. Nighttime awakenings are approximately four times a month. Short acting beta agonist use is greater than two days per week, but not once daily. Interference with normal activities, there is minor limitation. Lung function is not normal. FEV1 is greater than 82% predicted, but FEV1 and FEC ratio is normal. If this condition persists for greater than or equal to 2 years, then obviously frequency and severity may fluctuate over time. There is a relative annual risk of exacerbation that will require systemic corticosteroids. Now, if the condition is moderate, persistent moderate asthma, that is the symptoms appear daily and nighttime awakenings are every day per week but not nightly. Not acting beta 2 agonists are being given daily. Interference with normal activity, some limitation. FEV1 has now become greater than 60% but less than 80% predicted. FEV1 by FVC ratio is not normal anymore. It is reduced to 5%, reduced by 5%. Again, if the condition persists for greater than or equal to two times per year or uh, twice per year, then again, if the occurrence is greater than two times per year, then you can consider it as an exacerbation that requires oral systemic corticosteroids. Now, coming on to the last category, that is a severe persistent asthma where the symptoms occur throughout the day. Nighttime awakenings are often daily, every day of the week. Short acting beta 2 agonists are taken or consumed for symptom control several times per day. Normal activity is extremely limited. Lung function is less than 60% FEV1 as predicted. And FEV1 to FPC ratio is reduced by greater than 5%. In such cases, and these events occur greater than twice a year, then exacerbation requires oral corticosteroid, systemic corticosteroid that should be given. And the relative annual risk of exacerbation could be related to the FEV1 value that we get. Okay, moving on. So this classification, two types of asthma, intermittent and persistent. And persistent is divided into mild, moderate and severe Thing. Whereas the components of severity include lung function, normal activity interference, the use of beta 2 agonist symptoms, and nighttime awakening. And whenever these uh, severe incidents of asthma persist, it will require any exacerbation, will require oral systemic corticosteroids as well. Moving on, management of asthma. In a broad context, the goals of chronic asthma management can be divided into two that is, reduction in impairment and reduction in risk. Goals in the domain of reduction in impairment include minimization of daytime respiratory symptoms, that is coughing, wheezing, dyspnea, need to minimize that, minimization of nighttime awakenings, minimizing the need for rescue inhaler use, 
preserving and optimizing lung function maintenance and ability to perform physical activities including usual daytime activities and exercise the goals in the domain of reducing the risk for the patient include prevention of exacerbation of asthma that require urgent or emergent hospitalization by preventing exposure to allergen or triggers prevention of loss of lung function prevention of side effects of medication clinicians should strive for good asthma symptom control regardless of the level of asthma severity Symptom control reflective of well-controlled asthma is characterized by lack of asthma interference with normal activity and the rule of cool. As daytime symptoms no more than twice per week, nighttime symptoms no more than twice per month, and short-acting bronchodilator usage for symptom relief less than twice weekly. Now, asthma management. There are several headings that undergo uh, in asthma management that nursing and the healthcare team looking after the person or the individual needs to take care of. First of all, which is asthma education, a key component of asthma management is an ongoing process that should be integrated into every patient visit. The verbal communication and written educational documents such as asthma action plans have been shown to reduce asthma-related morbidity and mortality. Patient education on topics like trigger avoidance, proper inhaler use, and appropriate medication regimes are essential and warrant review at each office visit. Also help in reducing emergency visits and emergency hospitalizations for asthma as well. Monitoring lung function is also a critical part of asthma management. Asthma guidelines recommend spirometry annually for patients older than age five. Since many patients with asthma perceive symptoms poorly, an objective assessment of asthma control is an essential complement of the subjective symptom assessment described. Now, trigger avoidance is important in minimizing asthma flares. Exposure to dust, mites, molds, pollens, animal dander, smoke, fumes should be minimized if possible by patients with asthma who are affected by such triggers. Pharmacotherapy is the cornerstone of asthma management, including four kinds of acting beta agonist, long acting beta agonist that are given to the patient as a part of pharmacological therapy to manage symptoms and to reduce airway inflammation, to dilate the smooth muscles of the airway so that the turbulence or the uh, airflow obstruction is relieved and the patient is able to breathe properly. Management of comorbid conditions that complicate asthma, such as GERD, allergic rhinitis, sinusitis. obstructive sleep apnea and depression is also essential pharmacological management now as described previously will include control agents such as inhaled corticosteroids long acting bronchodilators that is beta agonists and anticholinergics theophylline leukotriene modifiers and more recently strategies such as the use of anti immunoglobulin ig antibodies and anti il5 antibodies so that these antibodies are not formed and therefore this inflammatory reaction in the bronchioles does not occur and the smooth muscles do not contract of the bronchia therefore causing congestion Uh, air flow obstruction and air very modeling inflammation and wheezing so to prevent the entire thing from its root the strategy of using anti immunoglobulin has also started as a treatment for uh, asthma so bronchodilators are beta 2 agonists and anticholinergics corticosteroids also leukotriene modifiers mast cell stabilizers all preventing the anti inflammatory action immunomodulators are basically preventing the development of uh, ig antibodies in the body methylxanthines and corticosteroids child instructions now when the patient for asthma flare up or any any asthmatic issue has come up in the hospital and has to be discharged or daily visit has come for daily checkup so has to be discharged you have to give certain instructions so that they able to control their asthma attacks and asthma exacerbation at home and reduce emergency hospitalization so that could include telling them to take their asthma medication exactly as the provider tells them even if they feel that the asthma is under control learning how to monitor their own asthma some people watch for early change of symptoms getting worse You use a peak flow meter. Your healthcare provider may decide to give you an asthma action plan. It will dependent on how the patient is uh, comfortable with. Be sure to always have a quick relief inhaler with you. Given a prescription, make sure to get it filled at the pharmacy as soon as possible. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you understood the uh, pathology and the pathogenesis of asthma, how it occurs and how it can be prevented. What are its triggers? How we can manage a situation or a condition of asthma? And what are the discharge instructions and asthma education treatment that we need to give patient? clinically as nursing and as a nursing individual and as a healthcare professional as well so that's it for today i hope uh, the topic was well understood hope to see you again with another topic another day.